what does the energy transition in shipping mean for Asia? Thank you, Andrew. Um, I hope everyone is settled in. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chi Chuan. The industry knows me as CC. And I'm joined today by a really, really star-studded panel. Uh, today's topic is essentially any tr energy transition for shipping in Asia. Um, and we had a very nice preamble in the panel earlier where we saw the, the likes of Maersk, ONE, your major liner operators. Then you had the, sm the, the smaller players like Taylor Maritime and Smulik on express feeders, really showing that there is, everyone is basically running a race. There is a finish line, which is IMO 2050. We have to get there 50% by 2050. And everyone has different starting points um, and different weights, weights attached to them. Now, the, the topic marine money has given to us really suggests that the difference lies in geography, east versus west. But we all know it's much more than that. It's also sector dependent. As we can see, the container industry is a bit ahead of the game. And we also know that it depends on the size of the company, whether you're a feeder, whether you're a major liner operator, SME or large cooperation, and the nature of trade. Are you doing short haul? Are you doing long haul? I think to make today's session as productive as possible, I really want to bring the focus on the balance that exists between the maritime industry, between owners, charterers, and regulators. Now, as ship financiers, we obviously have a lot of conversation with owners, and we encourage them to go on their green journey, installing green technology, and a common um, response by them is, we would love to, but the charters are not paying for it. Obviously, we finance charters as well, and then we go to the charters, and charters are like, well, I would love to pay for it, but my competitors are not paying for it. You need the regulators to make sure it's an even playing field for everyone. And then we go to the regulators, who obviously they have the unenviable task of basically establishing this balance of coming up with a proposal that is conservative enough for ship owners to want to implement it, but at the same time aggressive enough um, to, to meet carbon decarbonization targets. So to help me explore this balance today, um, we have representation from each of these parties. We have Toby, um, who, who represents the charters. We have Christina from DNV, who represents the owners. And finally, we have Bo, Lynn, and Johanna, who represent the not-for-profit organizations coming up with solutions to help the industry, dr industry drive decarbonization while tackling this balance. So I'd like to kickstart today's questions with Toby, the one footing the bill. Um, and the end user of the vessels. Now, Toby, I'm a Singaporean, born and bred. Um, extremely proud to read that our very own Pavilion Energy imported its very first carbon neutral LNG cargo last year. Now, there are two parts to my question. Could you share a bit more about Pavilion Energy's transition? And secondly, I think you're a fantastic person to, under, uh, to answer this question, having had stints in both the East and West. Um, you've been with Rio Tinto, um, and Reliance, as well as your current with Pavilion, you've had stints in Coke and VTOL. Um, how do you see the pace of decarbonization in Asia relative to the pace of that in the West? Toby, please. Thanks, CC. Um, so Pavilion, yes, we imported our first carbon neutral cargo last year, and we did that in partnership with the um, study with Catagas and Chevron on developing a formula, an industry-wide formula, for how you calculate uh, emissions. So that's been really useful, and we, we're pushing that with all of our counterparts. We are building a, a, a bunkering, an LNG bunkering vessel in Singapore, which will be finished, it's going to be built in Singapore by Singaporeans. Um, and that will be uh, completed in the third quarter of this year, so we'll be uh, offering bunkering services we're also pushing for scope three recording. We've started um, doing scope three recording. I think one of the things we'd probably say is we're disappointed in our counterparts. Um, when we ask our counterparts for their scope three information, they're point blank refusing. Um, so we have to estimate it and we've, we've got tools to do that. So uh, we're doing that and then we've joined, joined up on ammonia with the Global Center for Decarbonization um, as perhaps one of the future fuels. So we're looking at that um, quite excitingly, but at the moment we're obviously focused on LNG. Now on the chartering side, I think there's a couple of issues and, and I don't necessarily see there's that much of a divide between East and West. 
Um, I mean, I think what we would, you know, maybe this is a personal view, but we need some good public policy. We actually need some public policy out there that helps us drive and support this agenda. Because at the moment, many sectors of the industry, if you look at the tanker industry, they're, they're um, paying for past um, investments to, to manage IMO 2020 and you know, how, how to look for the future. But for us, I think there's a couple of uh, issues we're looking at, is we're gonna have to change the mindset of the charterer. If you're taking long-term ships, some of our ships are 20-year charters, we're going to have to invest ourselves in the ship. We're gonna have to, should we make the ship more slippery with ALS or something like that, but we're gonna have to do this. Um, I think we're going to have to look at um, every voyage because CII, whilst it's a one-off number perhaps, or an annual number, if you look at an LNG ship, you can have a brand new state-of-the-art LNG ship. If you operate it poorly, she will be an E. Very easily you make that ship an E, and you can have a steam ship at a B quite easily. So this, this, you can't associate modern ships with good performance. Um, we also need to get industry globally to change, especially in LNG, to change the way we view the molecule. We need to be able to cool down the ships much more frequently. We need to be able to have um, the ability to take the carbon off the ship or use the, use the best carbon for uh, moving, moving the product. And I think in Asia, we're well suited. We have huge resources for clean energy. Uh, you know, the Singapore government's looking at uh, dams in Laos. Uh, there's the potential cable from Australia. Australia in itself is turning into a sort of warfare between the states on who can be the biggest hydrogen producer. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, potential hydrogen by about 2030 into the 2030s. And, and with some good public policy and some change of behavior of charterers, we can actually cap, cap this, tap into it and, and, and take, take us well past perhaps what's required. Thanks, Toby, for sharing the, the Chatra view um, and noted your point on more public policy is needed. And we now move on to Christina. Now, Christina, DNV is the world's largest classification society with more than 13,000 vessels on its book. So I think you're in a very good position to represent both the views of owners in the East and West and class. Um, two parts to my question as well. Could you share any interesting decarbonization trends that you are seeing uh, with the owners that you represent? Um, and I, I note that approximately two-thirds of the order book is still based on conventional oil. Um, and secondly, any com comments as well on the pace of change on East versus West? I know Toby mentioned that there's actually not much difference between East and West, so please to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Maybe I can start with that one. I think um, that uh, maybe before the Asian owners were lagging a little bit behind, but I think that now they are even or even better. Uh, to be honest, uh, it's really encouraging and inspiring to see uh, such forward-leaning uh, ship owners, charters, financial institutions that are pushing the decarbonization agenda and that are actually taking some risks. Uh, I think that recently we could hear that uh, in terms of tonnage, actually the, the Asian owners are yeah, outcompeting the, the European competitors and I think we're just going to see this more and more. And I think that one of the, um, the points that uh, encourages this is, uh, is, is not, also, uh, not only about um, uh, tonnage or amount of tonnage, uh, technology, new fuels, but it's also about the ecosystem uh, that we have around us, right? And uh, I think we're going to see the same in terms of uh, green finance. We see the same in terms of uh, advances of ports and bankering infrastructure. So, uh, so I think that the role of, the, of, of a government or uh, public institutions, like for example in Singapore, MPA, is really crucial. And I think that uh, uh, establishing this uh, public and uh, private partnership like, for example, uh, the Global Center of Maritime Decarbonization is a yeah, very good initiative to continue to help uh, push the, um, the decarbonization agenda. Uh, to address your first point uh, regarding uh, yeah, uh, vessels that are being ordered uh, with conventional fuels versus uh, alternative fuels. I think we need to kind of see the other way and, uh, and see how we have progressed in the last year. Uh, which basically have gone from nearly nothing to 30% uh, of all the tonnage uh, that is being ordered is with alternative fuels. So I think we have seen momentum, which is great. I think what is important is that we continue taking steps 
uh, and that those that haven't taken steps yet are yeah, doing it. So I think we are in a good path, but we are in a hurry, and uh, I think it's, 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 we need to tackle many things at the same time and fast. We need to tackle and have um, clear regulations. We need to tackle the technology, the alternative fuels, the supply and, uh, and demand balance. We need the green finance, and uh, last but not least, we need incentives for the first movers. Thank you. Lots of actions, and I like how you flipped it the other way around. I talked about two-thirds are running on conventional oil, and you said, no, we've went from zero to 30%, so it's great. Um, maybe we can move on to the, to the other three uh, not-for-profit organizations. We've obviously heard from charters, we've heard from owners and class societies. Um, let's start first with you, Bo. Um, lots of exciting things going on in Musk, McKinney, Moller. Um, there was an industry transition strategy paper that was published six months ago. May I invite you to share some key takeaways from this paper and you know, what else has been keeping you busy for the past six months since this paper was published? Over to you, Bo. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely, I'd love to do that. And it's, it's great to be on stage with my two good uh, colleagues, uh, Johanna and Lynn, from the, the other uh, decarbonization centers. Um, so yes, uh, I'd love to share a few insights from that. Our, our um, industry transition strategy basically is set out to explain how it is possible for the shipping industry to decarbonize over the next three decades, looking at uh, the real sort of commercial picture with also acknowledging that this is at the end of the day driven by business and investments, and it has to be investable and bankable. And so we looked at this, and, and we are quite hopeful, actually, that it is possible to do it, but it is a daunting task. So I think uh, the main takeaways uh, from that report was that we need to focus on four things to really get going. And um, the first thing is energy efficiency. And there's still a lot that can be done in our industry in terms of energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is a very cost-effective way of decarbonizing. And, and we have looked across the global uh, fleet and can see that if we can just leverage existing technologies, share and implement best practices across, break down some of the barriers between owners and, and operators and charters, and use digitalization in that, there's a huge potential in, in, in that space. But let me rather talk about the uptake of, of green fuels because that's what's on most people's mind uh, these days. So, so these uh, new fuel types will be necessary in order to make absolute reductions of the carbon emissions. And, and according to the IPCC, for example, that came out again yesterday, we need to get that going urgently. And so to get that going, uh, we believe it's basically about three different things. So it is about enabling multiple fuel pathways to scale. And right now we can see at least four real pathways that are scalable. And those are methanol, ammonia, methane, uh, and bio-oils. Those can be made sustainable and scalable. So, so we can get back to that. That's sort of a longer term. That will take time to remove the barriers. Each of these pathways have the barriers and they have to be removed so it's safe and just and truly sustainable with these pathways. So that's like a technical economic exercise. Then in order also to make it, it really scale, we need global policy and regulation, like we said. So we need some kind of carbon pricing mechanism to make this truly investable for the big scale and for the long term. And to get to that point, and that needs to scale around 2030, and meaning we have eight years to get, that, to get to that point where it really scales in the industry. To get to that point, we need to find the first movers. We need to support the first movers, and we need to make sure that we get going with business that actually starts to show how the business can be done um, and, and also, by doing that, informing the policy system that this is doable, we understand the implications, we understand the risks, and whether you are a developing country or you are a developed country or whoever you are in that uh, ecosystem, 
you can actually be confident that it is safe to move ahead with uh, these global regulations. So it's extremely important that we get uh, going with the first movers. And this is why also from our center side, we've focused now a lot on what we call the first mover program, which does not necessarily mean that you have to jump all in with the big uh, carriers and the big cargo segments, but we have to find the lowest hanging fruits. We have to be able to aggregate demand from the customers across the spectrum that are actually willing to pay a premium to get their products transported. We have to get together with public sector, meaning there are countries now that are willing to invest in this transition as well. Uh, and so it's really about finding those first movers that are willing to lean in across the value chain and then get it going. And that is also now emerging to us that this is doable. So we're not talking about, you know, the 90 or the 100% of the market. Maybe we're talking about 1% of the market in the beginning, but it should be doable to find that and to get going. So that's really what we're doing now. And we just launched the European Green Network or Green Corridor Network, which is all about that. Uh, inviting energy companies, governments, ship owners, ports into a concrete collaboration to, to get going. Thank you. Thanks, Bo. Clearly, a lot of hard work and research has gone into this, and, and this paper as well that's published is free to read, so I would encourage audience in the room who, ha who has not read it to go and check that out. Um, moving on to our final two panelists from GCMD and GMF. Um, obviously, as we have an Eastern focus today, maybe I'll start with Lynn. Um, hi, Lynn. Global Center for Maritime De Decarbonization was formed in August last year. Um, and you actually joined the industry without prior maritime experience, which I always think is amazing to bring experience from elsewhere um, and, and then attack the maritime problems with fresh ideas and perspectives. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit more about, about GCMD firstly. And, and secondly, since you just joined the maritime sector, I think we would love to hear more about the challenges you are facing, um, especially since a lot of your founding partners are based in the East. Uh, thanks, Cece, for that question, and hello, everybody. So this meeting is actually pretty special to me because this was the first meeting in September 2021 last year that I came wearing the GCMD hat, and that was fresh out of quarantine. So coming back here is, is special. <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to sort of flip your question around. You said challenges, and whenever we think about challenges, we should think about opportunities too. And so I'd like to sort of talk about the opportunities. And it's good to come after Bo because I think um, from what I say, you'll see the complementarity between our two centers. Um, we are very much aligned in our mission. We are very much aligned in sort of where we need to be going. I think where we differ and where there's complementarity and where it's additive is our approach. And so Bo talked about the strategic report in this paper. We come from a bottom-up approach. We are focusing on pilots. We'd like to do. And so by doing, we're going to learn. And if we, fail fa if we fail, we fail fast and we learn faster. So that's sort of the whole idea. So we can look to Bo's reports. We can look to Bo's center for guidance on the pathways. And then we can try things, uh, given who we are and given how we're set up. We have the financial means to start pilots. Uh, we're partners with the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, so that provides us access to regulators and regulatory authorities. So it allows us to kind of speed things up in that sense because we can have frequent dialogues to kind of get the pilots started. And then, and then our learnings can feed back into, you know, Bo Center in terms of thinking about refining the pathways. So that's how we see ourselves working together. Um, in terms of opportunity, so uh, let me give you a couple of concrete things. I think um, Bo mentioned safety as being one of them. Um, the very first study that we embarked on is uh, to look at ammonia safety. Um, so this was looking towards green fuels, recognizing that we do need green fuels to get to the net zero targets. Um, so it's important for us to look at green fuels. And then we looked across the supply chain and we said, well, where are there gaps that we can fill? Uh, we know the first engine's going to be built in uh, 2024, we know the first ship's going to be available in 2025. There are going to be pilots on these ships that are going to be done. Where is the gap? And we quickly identified safety as being a gap. How do you transfer the molecule physically from one place to another safely as a bunker fuel? 
it's being transferred as a cargo, but that's a little different because, you know, the transfer frequency is different, the configuration by which you transfer is different, not to mention where you do this transferring is very different as well. So we identified safety as being one of these most important things. So two months into our setting up, uh, we basically put out an invitation for proposal to look at the safety. And the goal is to come up with guidelines, safety guidelines, operational guidelines, uh, to, to be able to then set up a regulatory sandbox with which we can do a pilot. Okay, so the end goal is a pilot. Um, and then with that, then hopefully we can push it through the technical committees with the improved safety guidelines, et cetera, et cetera, to set up standards um, so that when the green fuels are ready, when they're available at scale, we're ready to go ahead. So this is how we sort of fill in the gap. Another example would be, you know, um, Bo mentioned uh, uh, biofuels, and, um, and so we need to think about the idea of drop-in so we're blending biofuels with fuel oil, and eventually uh, we're gonna be blending bio-LNG with LNG or green fuels eventually with gray fuels simply because the green fuels aren't gonna be available at scale immediately, so you have to kind of dial it in, right? Um, and talking to all our stakeholders, so in Q4 last year we spoke with more than 150 stakeholders, and this is, this is sort of, behind doing pilots, right? You really need to understand where the pain points are, so the operational feasibility of things. Um, it was identified that the transparency across a supply chain is really important to lower the barrier for people to adopt fuels. Uh, these green fuels are drop-in fuels. And so we have, we're scoping another project right now, a pilot, to provide transparency and assurances on the quality, the quantity, the abatement, of green fuels, so when you command a green premium, how do you know you're getting what you think you're getting, right? So we believe that by doing these kinds of pilots, we can lower the barrier for the sector to adopt these uh, low carbon solutions cheaper, faster, and cleaner. Thank you, thank you, Lynn. I, uh, there's a saying in shipping, um, if, you, if you stay past the industry for more than six months, you're basically gonna retire in the industry. So I look forward to many marine monies with you. Now that you've just crossed the six-month mark. Uh, right, we've heard sort of a top-down approach, and we've heard from bottoms-up approach. Uh, may I move on now to Johanna? Um, Johanna, you're the CEO of Global Maritime Forum, founded in 2017, so you've got sort of five years, four years head start compared to the GCMD. Um, Lynn has sort of brought up, I wanted her to discuss challenges, but she's brought up opportunities, so I'll leave it to you to discuss maybe opportunities, challenges in the West, and whether top-down, bottoms-up, and obviously we're, we're together on Poseidon principles as well, so it's quite an open question for you to, to, to the floor is yours. I might, I might find it a little bit hard to move past the image of all of us being up here in I don't know how many decades as we near retirement, but thank you very much for that point. Um, um, sorry, that's hard to collect myself upon that. But, and I also appreciate the, the point that Lynn just made, which is that really we should be talking about uh, opportunities uh, rather than just barriers and challenges, although there are also many of those. And in fact, I might rephrase uh, uh, Jeremy's point from the previous panel about the, the 1.5 uh, trillion uh, US dollars worth of investment that is needed over the coming years as an investment opportunity, in fact. It's one where there will be many winners along the way, and I think we should keep that in mind as, as we embark on this journey, uh, and we're already well on our way. So the Global Maritime Forum is, in this particular space and on other issues as well, very much focused on on mobilizing the sector. And so where we are, obviously we have some technical depth, but, but nowhere near uh, can match neither the, um, the MERS Center nor the Global Center here in Singapore. What we uh, bring to the table is a platform for mobilization. And that's really our, 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 um, our mission and, and how we work. And, and, and in mobilization in particular where cross-industry collaboration is needed. And this is really a point that also came very clearly out, out of the previous panel. This is not a, an, uh, a challenge that any one part of the sector can solve on its own. We're going to need uh, the ship owners, the cargo interests, um, <laughs> the classification societies, um, the shipbuilding. You left finance out of the sort of constellations of stakeholders that need to work together. But in fact, finance uh, plays a critical role in, in making this transition possible. 
So all of these stakeholders to actually work together and, and creating a collaborative platform where they can all come together and work together on solving the many challenges that we face and, and, and reaping the sort of um, unlocking the opportunities that are also there. And now that sounds very broad, but there are also really specific ways in which we do this. So uh, a good example, uh, and Bo already mentioned this sort of concept of green quarters. So I was really pleased to be able to present an initial analysis that we put together in the fall around uh, the concept of green quarters and, and how this might be a way to um, simplify uh, the challenge of decarbonization by breaking it down into geographic opportunities functionally. And in, in this context, already some really specific low-hanging fruit, I think is also how you, uh, how you spoke, spoke about it, were, were identified. Um, an Australia to Asia green corridor, for example, um, transporting iron ore uh, is one, one such opportunity that was identified. A Europe to Asia container route could be a potential um, avenue or a, 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 a potential um, a, a direct opportunity that stakeholders could come together around. And we're seeing more and more of these kinds of consortia forming around really specific opportunities, and we play a role in facilitating some of those consortia. So, so that's, of course, that, that's a really concrete way. There are many other ways as well. Um, yeah, I, we can get into some more of them, <laughs> but, uh, but that's just giving some, some, some immediate examples. Thanks, Johanna. Um, maybe I can move back to Lynn. Um, there was an article last week on GCMD basically piloting shipping's move into alternative fuels, and hydrogen was, was basically something you guys were looking at. This was on Trade Winds on Friday. Um, and hydrogen was one of the four fuels that Bo, you actually didn't really say yet was sustainable and scalable as of now. Um, but feel free to talk about that or, or any other initiatives that GCMD is, 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 is looking at and working at. Um, since you talked about opportunities, maybe we can focus on what you've done over the past six months and, and what achievements you've had. Wow, the, the bar is set really high, what I've done over the last six months, <laughs> considering the energy transition, right? Um, so, um, so we believe for a green fuel that uh, you'll have to think about hydrogen carriers as opposed to hydrogen, simply because if you look at the space that's required to carry the same amount of hydrogen that would produce the energy for you to take that route, uh, relative to fuel oil, it's four and a half times more. Relative to LNG, it's two and a half times more. So, so I think space is one thing, which is so precious on ships, and also the cryogenic conditions that are required. So we think that um, hydrogen carriers like green methanol, like green ammonia, are probably the easier routes, but I'm not going to say never, right? Uh, but, but we think it's, it's going to be those as opposed to hydrogen. That said, in order for you to get to green ammonia and green methanol, you do need green hydrogen. And so this is sort of where I think we need to think about the energy transition as a transition. It's not going to happen overnight. Because if you trace back to where the green ammonia and the green methanol can come from, you need green hydrogen. And currently, just uh, this was Q3, I think Q3 or Q4, Bloomberg had an article about how much green hydrogen uh, is in, uh, demand is in the pipeline, and that was 200 gigawatts equivalent. If you look at electrolyzers that are available to produce hydrogen, not green hydrogen, just hydrogen in general, it's 200 uh, megawatts equivalent. If you look at then the amount uh, of electrolyzers and power that's available to produce green hydrogen, it's only 20 megawatt equivalent, right? So, I mean, I think the scale is just not there. So we, we really need to be realistic about where things are. And so I think that's the point of the article. So, okay, going back to green ammonia and green methanol, you need green hydrogen. And we've just talked about how much you need of green hydrogen. But you then also have to go backwards to think about where the renewable energy is gonna come from, where the renewable electrons are gonna come from. Um, so, so because of this, and there are end uses, multiple end uses in each case for calling for green electrons and green hydrogen, right? So, um, so our, our marine, marine sector is not the only one that's going to call for these kinds of 
the end users. So, so I think the complication and the complexity is there, and that's why it's important to think about um, a rich ecosystem so that you can move forward, right? And so um, I think it's, it's tempting to just kind of look at ship owners and ship charters, but really to move forward on the decarbonization front, you need, like Johanna said, you need the cargo owners, but you also need sort of upstream, right? So the energy producers are really, really important. And so today we've uh, just signed a strategic partnership agreement with BP, welcoming them as a strategic partner precisely for this reason, because they can provide unique perspectives as existing sort of energy producers um, in the energy infrastructure, but also going forward, how they think about this transition and how that transition influences us vice versa. Congratulations on signing that partnership. Um, so we, we've been exploring sort of a bottoms up approach. Maybe I can go back to you, Bo, where in this paper, um, you, there was a proposal of a carbon price tax of, tax of $230 per ton of CO2 to be implemented in 2025, um, with the proceeds collected compensating early adopters of alternative fuels, so a very nice sort of carrot and stick. Would you like to elaborate a bit more on this or any other sort of uh, proposals you guys are looking at for this? Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. So carbon pricing, uh, as I think we pretty much all agree, is going to be important to, at the end of the day, pull the entire industry along. And, and it's a big question now how this is going to play out. And, and I don't think anybody can confidently say how, how that is going to happen. We see a lot of uh, national developments. We see a lot of regional developments. We see also international global developments in IMO. And, and these are all playing together. Uh, so what we've tried to do from the center side is to take an overall look at just first of all what levels, uh, what kind of money are we talking about uh, to really get it going. And the point we're making in that uh, industry transition strategy is that if you have to do it by a pure, uh, you know, stick approach, uh, then you need to punish uh, the fossil side uh, pretty hard, like $200 a ton of CO2, which translates into something like three times as much per ton of fuel, right? Um, but if you do it smartly, and those are the schemes that are being discussed now, whether it's an ETS in EU with a, with a certain uh, fencing of the shipping industry, uh, whether it's a levy system in, uh, in IMO, if you do it smartly, you don't actually need to go to those levels at all. Uh, because if you do it in a way where you earmark the revenue and turn it back to the first movers, to some, probably some R&D, and to the developing countries to help ensure that there's a just and there's a social uh, taken care of as well in this transition, you can actually do with much lower levels of carbon pricing, like $50 a ton. So it's all about how you design that mechanism. And that's our point uh, in the study. So, so now when we work uh, towards uh, IMO, for example, and towards uh, uh, EU, that's what we are having in mind, you know, that it's not just about, you know, putting a, a punishment on uh, to, to sort of bridge the gap. It's really about uh, working with it in a, in, a, in a slightly smarter way. And, and, so th and, and I think there's some really good good things happening also in IMO now that make us hopeful that we can actually move uh, in that direction. So I think that's a really, key, a really key point. And I'd like to say here also that we talk a lot about collaboration. We, we talk a lot about the need for carbon pricing, we talk about the need for maturing and testing new technologies, and we talk a lot about the need for collaboration. And I fully agree that collaboration is important. The three centers that are, are lo that are here on stage today, we are, we are sharing openly between us what we're doing. And I think we all share the idea that there's too much work to be done for any of us to start thinking about this as a zero-sum game. And I think the same kind of mindset needs to actually marinate the whole industry now with also, though, the thinking that some of it, we, Companies, it's, it's also naive to think that companies will share everything. So it's also about getting an understanding of what is it that we want to collaborate on and share, and what is it that we want to keep as proprietary. 
um, as proprietary knowledge. But it's extremely important to acknowledge that today there is basically no market for zero carbon shipping. So before we start competing, you know, let's just acknowledge that we don't have the standards. We don't have actually a big momentum right now building up. And so I'd really encourage, uh, of course, to reach out to our centers, but also when you are now setting up new projects in the ecosystem, and a lot of that is happening, and we just heard a great example from MISC, MISC for example, uh, when those projects are set up, there are certain learnings from those that are extremely valuable to share in terms of getting the right standards in place in particular, getting practices in place, creating confidence, like you said, Lynn, getting understanding of what are really sort of the real issues uh, related to the safety, for example. So, so there's just something really important for, for, I think, for this community to, to agree on that. Let's share a certain amount of knowledge, and then I think the three of us here, we're certainly collaborating and very willing to, to help facilitate that. I mean, if I can add to, uh, to the example, I think, um, so as we're scoping out this drop-in fuels framework, we're looking at biofuels as the first one, simply because biofuels is available. And so the team looked at prior biofuels trial, because the idea is, why would we want to duplicate effort, right? We want to learn from what we know from the past. So we counted more than 20 biofuels trials that have been done since 2016. And of those 20, more than 14 have been done since the sulfur regulation took place, so that's super relevant. Yet these are all one-off trials, right? You've tried, and then you're done. So I think um, increasingly, the co-learnings will allow us to move beyond the one-off trials, and we really need to move beyond the one-off trials if we want to make a dent on decarbonization. So I think we need to think about life cycle assessment, we need to think about route-based piloting, so identifying two ports where the trial actually take place between the two ports, but having infrastructure slowly built out at those two ports so that you can sustain subsequent um, beyond the first pilot, right? So, so I think those kinds of ideas need to kind of percolate in the sector as well, as opposed to, oh, we set sail with biofuels and then we measure and then we can, that's, that's all important because you need to test the engine as well, but I think we need to move beyond that and certain fuel types, the lower carbon fuels that are available today, are poised for those kinds of, you know, route-based pilots at this point. Thanks. And I think everything that was just mentioned um, involves costs, involves R&D, involves a carbon tax, involves the charters paying more. Maybe I can pivot back to Christina and Toby. I'll, I'll leave this as an open question to you. Um, having heard all these innovations and ideas and solutions, and, and you have to make profits for, for your companies at the end of the day, um, a, a, any comments from your side on this from a charters or owners and classification society point of view? So I think from a practical perspective, it's all great, and we're really supportive of it. But we have to understand shipping is a hugely conservative business. Changing contracts, which are 20, year, you know, 20 years duration midstream, is going to be very hard. There's always the excuse of the financier doesn't want to change the contract, or one, um, one participant doesn't want to change the contract. So I think you know, that's, a, that's a step that we have to look at. We have to uh, change the industry's mindset. Because probably by 2030, we'll have an agnostic engine to product. So if we have that, we're just looking for energy. That energy might be methanol, that energy might be LNG, that LNG, um, it might be um, ammonia. So we need to change the people's mindset. We're not buying a ton of fuel oil anymore. We're buying energy, BTUs. And so we need to change the way ship owners and charterers think throughout this process. I also think we need to look at um, just to make sure that everybody's trained and they understand. And, and going to your sharing, I mean, I was at breakfast this morning with a, a small scale methanol producer and you know, he was like, oh, wh why isn't methanol taking over? You know, it's so much better than ammonia. I heard that, uh, that when you inject uh, into a two stroke diesel engine that it leaks you know, in, in the injection process. Well, that doesn't work because if I'm injecting LNG into a two stroke diesel engine at 320 bar, which is what we do on a Meggy engine, I've got LNG in the engine, and that engine space will blow up. And we haven't done that yet. So all of these little anecdotes need to be squashed so that we look at 
the product for the best product for the for that trade for that ship for that route and we go after the best product and and remove some of the sort of you know little you know my friend on a plane told me sort of stories that we still get today yeah no i mean from our our role as a class society is basically to help set standards and to help make sure that whatever technology and whatever fuel we want to apply, it can be done safely. So, so, so safety, uh, just to put it back again, it's really the foundation, and uh, and it needs to happen. Otherwise, it will backfire us. So, uh, so that's also why the reason why last year we we actually uh, founded the Maritime Technology Forums together with other class societies and flag states in order to you know help the the, the industry setting those uh, standards. So um, yeah, I think that uh, that is what we need to do. But apart from that, obviously joint R and D uh, so that we can pilot fast, we can scale. It's really important for the for the industry. Thanks, Christina. Um, so I think we spent the past portion of this panel exploring ESG solutions and opportunities. Um, earlier when I started this session, I talked about how everyone's essentially running a race. There's a finish line. Um, people are saying that the finish line could be a moving target as well. Um, as it stands, IMO 2030 and 2050 decarbonization targets, they're actually not aligned to 1.5 degree um, pathways. Can I just take a quick poll here? Um, Three responses, yes, no, no comment. Do you think current trajectories sh by the IMO should be lowered even further? Who says yes? I think we need to contextualize the answer. <laughs> no, <laughs> please, please, Lynn, please contextualize the answer. <laughs> yes, I think, I mean, the target is a target. It's an aspiration, it's an ambition. We, it's our North Star. We absolutely should aim high, right? But... I think we need to be grounded in where we are and where we're starting from and, and appreciate the challenges there along the way. And so I think the transition's going to happen. Um, we should push as fast as we can on the longer term solutions like the green fuels, but also move on the near term and the midterm solutions like, you know, the, um, because the, the supply chain and the infrastructure is available for the lower carbon fuels today, like the biofuels and the LNG. And we can see pathways, like Bo said, for LNG, for example, yes, you need to make sure that there's no methane slip, you need to make sure that there's no leakage, so their life, life cycle assessment needs to be tight. But you can see a transition from uh, liquefied natural gas to bio-natural gas, right? And then if you then add in the carbon capture, you can bend the curve and continue to keep bending the curve. And so that's what we need to think about. So yes, absolutely, we should raise our aspirations, but, but let's not fool ourselves that, you know, we know how we can get there today because we don't. If I may, I just uh, totally agree with you, Lynn, and I think it's uh, about everyone taking the first steps. Not forget about the energy efficiency measures that you mentioned, that uh, there's still something to get from here. And really don't let the perfect be an enemy of the good, because we have good solutions that can take us a little bit further today. If I may add to that, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put on the the uh, the yay sayers hat for a moment amongst the names. Oh, we're all saying yes. <laughs> no, no, I I get that. Uh, yes, but <laughs> but I think I think the this I think it's important to note that there's a whole industrial system around shipping, that there are other industries that are moving at the same time. There's a financial sector that is moving at leaps and bounds towards setting targets that way outpace uh, the shipping sector. If shipping doesn't move to meet those same aspirations, it will not be possible to raise the kind of capital that we need to make this transition happen. It, it would simply not, it, banks will stop financing shipping. <laughs> so, so there's also, uh, the same goes true on the, on the cargo side. There are many, many, many multinational companies at a global scale that are, are setting these, these these very ambitious targets, and we just need to be sure that we are uh, uh, that we're uh, w that we're uh, responding appropriately to that those outside pressures as well. Let's not forget that. Thanks for that, Joanna. Um So I'd say yes because I have a son, and and you know, <laughs> for for my children or my child. Um, but I also want to make sure that we're not robbing Peter to sort of put it somewhere else or PayPal or whatever. Say, you know, methane is 70 times worse than carbon. 
So we need to make sure that, well, that's what I've been told. You might correct me. Um, so, you know, we just need to make sure that the alternative is probably a good thing as well. Um, and, we're, and we're not pushing it down to, you know, you know, in my lifetime, I've, I've had holes in the ozone layer and, and, and refrigerants, and we've moved on from there, and we keep finding something else that does us, does us damage. And, and we need to also, I think, a little bit, and I've been listening to some podcasts recently, understand that carbon is also very important. So whilst we have to get rid of it from what we do in plants, in, in, in our ecosystem to make our foods food grow, we need carbon and, and, and we need to under, make sure that we're not necessarily bringing our children up to be this sort of an, carbon is the enemy sort of thing. Because in some, in my limited experience of listening to podcasts, um, thanks to Dr. Science with Dr. Carl, um, it's sort of important from what I can gather. Thank you, I like that. Uh, Bo, did you want to add something as well? Or? Contextualize, yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, I think, uh, I mean, uh, ever since I grew up, we've basically been on this path of improving technology, improving operations, increasing energy efficiency. We just have to realize that the absolute emission levels keep going up as we're doing all this. So I think it, I didn't mean actually to, to quote this American movie, but we have to look up, actually, and I think we, we just can't victimize ourselves. There's a million reasons to argue that it's too difficult and there are a lot of barriers and there's a lot of conservatisms and there's so much inertia and, and that is true. But I think also our, our objective is certainly to show that it is possible to do it, be realistic about it, base it on techno-economic analysis, but also be aware that for me, for example, I don't think it's an option to, to say uh, 15 years down the line that, you know, we knew we had a huge problem. Uh, we knew it was doable. We just didn't do it. That's just not an option. So, you know, we have to, we have to bring it to zero. We have to do it quickly, but we have to be realistic and not naive about it because it's a business system. It is investments. It's, it's people who put their pension money to things and... They need to get a return and all of that, that's a part of it. But we have to change, and there is no alternative. So, minus a, a yes. Thanks for that, everyone. Uh, I think we're running short on time, so maybe just a final question from me. Um, obviously, a lot of financiers today, uh, MPAs in the house as well. Can I just ask the panel, what is on your top to-do list for the next 12 months? Um, so, so maybe, maybe let's not go into to-do list. What's on top of your wish list for the next 12 months on what you wish your financiers, your other counterparts um, can do to help you on, on your, your company's journey towards ESG? Maybe I'll start with you, Johanna, and we can finish with Toby. I think the to-do list and the wish list are not that different from each other, unless we're talking about a wish list along the lines of I, I wish, like I, I'd like a pony type of thing. So, so, so um, for us uh, at the Global Maritime Forum, that's very much fo focusing on the regulatory space, so a global price on carbon. While I have all the same concerns and questions and, and doubts that everybody in this room probably has, we see it as absolutely necessary. And there's many steps that, be, that, be, that can be taken already this year to get us closer to the target. It, it requires addressing issues around equity. So how do we make it uh, whatever um, system of policy measures is put in place that it, uh, that it rewards first movers, but that it also addresses issues of equity. And James, I think you brought this up in the, uh, in the previous panel and, and, and probably didn't get enough um, discussion in it there. So let's make sure that we raise that as, as a point here as well. Um, uh, it, it requires being flexible, so thinking about what are the regional or national policies that can pave the way for global solutions. So all of those sorts of things are things we can do this year to get us to where we need to be, which is a, a, a global framework that can support the transition at whatever price point is necessary. Yeah, I would say maybe three things from my side. The first one is to start now. There are solutions now that are good. Again, let's not let the perfect be the enemy for the good. Uh, let's collaborate together. Decarbonization is a team sport. There's no one single country, there's no one single company that has all the ideas. So we need to work together. And then, um, yeah, I think that uh, we don't forget about safety. Safety really needs to be on top of the agenda and there's the foundation on everything we do. 
I'll mention two things. Um, the first one is to be very concrete. We are working now on three big feasibility studies on establishing green corridors. And 12 months from now, I would really like to understand what it takes uh, to make it possible to actually start shipping goods using green fuels on real ships with real cargo and customers that pay a green premium with governments that are part of it, supporting national infrastructure development, um, energy companies that lean in and, and start to actually produce. So really understand that down to, uh, to, down to the pennies and, 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 and make sure. And if there are gaps in there, and, and I don't think there is, it will be possible. It's only a matter of, uh, of the scale and the volume. So that's going to be extremely important for the next 12 months. And that's going to give a lot of insights into where are the real gaps in this system. So that's one. And the other one is on standards and regulation. And I think over the next 12 months, we need to see real concrete progress. And we are working on a very, rather detailed level with both IMO and EU to make sure that we have very robust life cycle standards in place so that we can ascertain, we can make sure that, that we know uh, and we can document uh, the climate impact of the different energy pathways. And then the second one is, of course, uh, the carbon pricing mechanisms in those two places. So those are my two top priorities. Thanks. All right. Um, well, I mean, for us, in 12 months, um, we would have scoped out a couple of these projects that I uh, was telling you about. But also, at the same time, the ammonia safety study would be done. And so I think, in that sense, uh, this is a no regret move, right? I mean, I think going in, we hope that we can kind of figure out the safety uh, envelopes around bunkering ammonia, but we would know for sure. And so if it's not possible, well, at least we know it's not possible. We would not be barking up that tree anymore, but I, I'm hopeful that you know we would be able to figure out how to do it safely. We would have defined two sites in Singapore where we can do the bunkering pilot, um, and so we would want to proceed with that. So uh, following up on that, I mean, you mentioned financing, and all of you here, um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. I think um, fundamentally with these kinds of infrastructure projects, whether it's building um, an ammonia barge or you know, storage terminal or whatnot, these are first-of-a-kind projects. So the risks associated with these first-of-a-kind projects are high. While we hear about climate action funds, and there's so much climate action funds out there, uh, the risk appetite for these kinds of capital don't match the risk profile of these projects. And so you mentioned MPA. We'd love to work with MPA and others in this room to figure out how to match them, whether it's bringing governments together to provide loan guarantees or philanthropic organizations and foundations to provide grants so that you can create something of a hybrid model where you then you know, lower the risk for the more conventional capital to come in as debt and equity. Um, I think it would go a long ways to help the sector, right? Because these are, there are going to be a lot of first-of-a-kind projects and a first-of-a-kind type um, infrastructure build-out that's going to be needed. And, and we really need to figure out that green financing piece. And we believe with our due diligence and we can add value in that ecosystem to try and unlock that green finance piece. So I suppose the first one is a challenge to you guys about green corridors. I was involved in a green corridor when I was at Rio Tinto. It took seven years. We don't have seven years, you know, so good luck with that one. I think um, on a practical <laughs> perspective, <laughs> I think from a practical perspective of operating ships, we need to be much more transparent with our information. We, we get consultants to help us understand how to operate our ships. Um, MIOC explained they're doing a lot of studies around how they operate their ships. How much of that information have you released to other operators? You know, when I speak to our operators, they go, oh, drive the ship down by about a meter and a half by the bow. It's 5% saving. How many people know on a low block coefficient ship that this is a potential saving in certain weather conditions? Yet there's all this research has been done. So what is actually proprietary and what should be there to help the world? And, and, and our children. So I think you know, when we're getting our consultants in and it helps our bottom line, what part of that information can we actually share to help our, we're not necessarily gonna lose competitiveness maybe as much, 
but how do we stop the same study being d done 16 times or whatever the, the sum was? So m I would say in the next 12 months, how do we, you know, when you guys come up with financing clauses that are a bit future-proof, share them instead of, you know, letting your legal counsel sort of keep them in-house. Um, that's what I'd ask for in the next 12 months. And good luck again. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone. I, I think that marks the end of our hour. Um, maybe I can wrap things up. Um, earlier at the start of the panel, I was talking about balance, and I think balance is needed in a lot of places between all the different parties involved. Um, key takeaways for me are that I think we should basically share knowledge as long as it's not proprietary. Um, Communication is essential, and forums such as these where we get multiple parties in one place to discuss ideas is very good. Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. There's many of us with collaborations amongst this panel, and maybe we can do more collaboration in, in the networking this afternoon. Um, and finally, I think there's a lot of innovation that was on display today, um, and today's theme is, is innovation. Um, and I would like to close off. My biggest key takeaway is that Asia is here. We have displayed in the past hour thought leadership and ESG transition can be driven in the East as well. Um, and that's basically my closing remarks. Thank you everyone for listening and thank you to my very hungry panelists who have uh, skipped their lunch for this. I believe we can now eat now. Thank you very much.